Um, welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Year of Optimization, How to Turn More Visitors into Buyers in 2022. My name is Elise and I'll be your host and co-presenter today. Um, at Trusted Site, we're always looking for new ways to help our customers build trust and improve conversions. So we're very excited today to have John McDonald join us. Um, John is the founder of The Good, which is a conversion rate optimization firm. And he's worked with some of the biggest names in e-commerce. So we're really looking forward to getting his insights into what's in store for CRO in 2022. Um, before we get started, here we have today's agenda. In just a moment, John and I will give some quick introductions and then John will take it away to share his laws of conversion rate optimization. Um, after that, I'm gonna be sharing some trust building tips that can help you with CRO. And finally, we'll be doing a live teardown of one of your sites and giving some actionable tips on how to optimize it. Um, and of course, we'll save some time at the end for questions. Um, if you do have any throughout the presentation, you can go ahead and submit them in the chat um, and we may be able to get to them um, as we proceed through the presentation as well. All right, so let's get into it here. Um, for those of you not familiar with Trusted Site, about 20 years ago, our founders created one of the world's first web application vulnerability scanners. Um, soon after that, they were acquired by McAfee and they began the website security program there. Um, through the years, McAfee went through some changes and now Trusted Site is fully independent, but we're still pursuing our same goal of helping our customers prevent a data breach with our security services known as Trusted Site Security, as well as helping to increase customer trust um, with the Trusted Site Certification Service. And if you're new to Trusted Site Certification, it's a service that helps e-commerce businesses grow and protect trust so that people can make safer and smarter purchases when they're shopping online. And it comes with a suite of certifications that sites can earn from certified secure to verified business to issue free orders. Um, once sites have earned these certifications, they're able to display our trust marks throughout the customer journey on their site. And over the years, we've researched the best and most effective ways to build trust online. And like I mentioned, today I'll be sharing some tips that can help you to improve your conversion rates. Um, and to take it a step further, we have John, who's going to be sharing his CRO expertise, including several laws of conversion rate optimization that he's written about in his new book. Um, so, John, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? All right. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, John McDonald. Uh, you did a great introduction, so I don't know what else is necessary okay. there, but I'm excited to be here today. Um, I always like to start every time I talk about CRO in this way. Uh, with a quote from Dr. Carl Blanks, who is the inventor of the term conversion rate optimization. And he said that the average web page is designed less scientifically than the average toilet brush. So see that the majority of website design and copywriting is still in that pre-scientific age. And most website designers rely on inspiration and not experimentation. To me, that's a problem. And that's why I started The Good over a decade ago. Next slide, please. So see, I'm on a mission. And The Good's mission is to remove all of the bad online experiences until only the good ones remain. And that means I need you all, everybody attending today, to change your websites for the better. And the outcome of that, I promise, is going to be higher conversions. Through our mission, we've been helping e-commerce companies increase sales over the years for well over a decade now with brands like Nike, Xerox, Adobe, The Economist, and many, many more. It used to be that conversion rate optimization was a differentiator, but now it's a requirement. It's no longer a competitive advantage. And I've heard so many times recently that traffic generation sources are just hurting. Ads cost more now than ever. Facebook return on ad spend is way down. You can all thank Apple for that, but you know Facebook hasn't really adjusted quite well. And I think it's interesting because many brands that have just pushed the easy button, put tons of cash into Facebook, and then would get conversions out. And maybe it wasn't as high of a return on ad spend as they'd like, but it was, it was a reliable source of, of revenue. And now that's just not as reasonable. And so let's talk a little bit about what you can do instead. 
you have some options. You can always cut that ad spend. You can focus on your own audience like content, SEO, et cetera. Or you can explore new channels like maybe influencer marketing. Uh, you can also get more out of every dollar you spend on ads. And obviously I'm a little biased, but that's what I would recommend. And so look, your brand, the site that you own is not affected by these latest changes. So optimizing your site can make up for a lot of the difference. So how do you get more out of every ad dollar? Let's walk through a few laws of conversion rate optimization. And as uh, was mentioned, these uh, are in part from a book I released uh, late last year called Opting Into Optimization. You can Maybe it's a little small, but you can see back here, I have a copy of it up there. Uh, so the first law of conversion rate optimization is that you need to understand as you optimize your site that customer experience drives improved conversion rates not the other way around. So what do I mean by that? A good conversion rate is the result of a healthy customer experience. It's not the cause. You can get a really good conversion rate because you have a good customer experience, but you don't get a great customer experience by having a high conversion rate. They're tied together, but it only goes one way. Or to put it this another way, a good conversion rate doesn't indicate that there's a healthy customer experience but a healthy customer experience can improve your conversion rates. And so it's really important to, to have that mindset as we go into this. How can you think about this? Well, once visitors have reached your site, your marketing has won. It's time to stop marketing and start selling. And to do that, you really need to serve the needs of your consumers. So let's look at an example of how you might apply this to your own site. You can still meet your visitors needs while baking your marketing messages into the shopping journey. This is a test that we ran for Beckett Simonon, which is a high end handcrafted shoe brand. So every shoe is custom made for the person that orders it. And you can see here that they really wanted to kind of bake that marketing messaging into the journey. So instead of just pushing the marketing message at people who were trying to shop. Instead, they're trying to put it in, the, in as part of that journey. And what we did here was on the left, you can see the control, which was their current um, category page, or on the right, which is the winning variation, where we added these tiles and replaced product with tiles around marketing messaging. This resulted in a 5% lift in conversions and a 237% return on their investment for doing this test. So why is that effective? Research you use to understand if your product or service can solve the consumer's pain or need. And if it can solve that pain or need, you can convert them as quickly and easily as possible. And I think it's really important to remember that consumers are only at your site for two reasons. You're not Facebook. I mentioned Facebook earlier. They're not coming there to hang out and catch up with their friends. They're there because they have a pain or a need and they think or something led them to think that you can solve their pain or need. And they really get to your site to research that, understand, can you help them? And if so, they want to convert and then get on with their life. So how can you apply that to your site? Here's a great example of how important it is for you to ensure that you are making it easy for consumers to do research. As uh, the majority of the world transitioned to work at home over the past couple of years, we were just talking about how our offices aren't being utilized right now. It, you know, high quality office furniture like this from Fully was in really high demand. Um, and specifically, their iconic Jarvis standing desk, which I'm actually sitting at right now. Um, I'm not standing. I probably should be for my health. But the reality is that it had a really long lead time. And something that is still unfortunately recognizable for probably a lot of the brands that are on this today because supply chain issues continue to be a challenge uh, years later. Well, this really presented some challenges for Fully, and the team at The Good knew there was an opportunity to perhaps creatively display their in-stock products in a way that gave customers the option to shop for something new. So our key learning from this was that you have to make 
a dialed in product filtering experience that will help enable easy research. And so we, our team looked at lots and lots of eye tracking heat maps and the engagement was all happening on the filtering so much so that our hypothesis was that that filtering was confusing. This change to the filters had a dramatic effect on conversions and revenue. And it is something that is actually fairly simple to implement. You can see they got about a 6% lift in conversions and they saw a 75 to one return on investment. So for every dollar they put into making this change and testing it and doing that research behind it led to 75 additional dollars in revenue. So pretty powerful changes. It's really hard to read the label from inside the jar. If you've ever seen me speak before or talk to me on the phone, you've probably heard me say this. And this is actually a chapter in that book. And the, the shared trend is that both of these laws and example are examples of what happens when you put the customer first. You might think that you know what the customer wants, but the best way is to find that out through customer research. We'll always say that it's hard to read the label from inside the jar because it's impossible for a brand to understand what the site experience is like for a new to file customer. Why is this perspective important? Well, first, it's really hard for a brand to optimize their own website because they just generally don't understand that unique perspective from that new site visitor. And second, if a visitor can't understand a brand's website, how to navigate it, what the value propositions are, or even what products the brand is selling, then they're just gonna bounce right away. So what can you do? Well, you can use data. So let's take a look at some of the data. To do this, you really need to move from data collection and tracking from ads to your own website. So I talked earlier about how you know these changes that are all happening around ads costing more, and they're all on third-party sites. They're all on Google, Facebook, uh, Instagram, et cetera, right? But those changes haven't necessarily impacted your site because you still have the ability to collect some aggregate, right? Not personally identifiable, but aggregate user data on your site. And that's really all that is needed for success. You don't need individual data. So privacy challenges and those changes that are happening won't kill your optimization efforts overnight. This means uh, conversion optimization, it's really a sustainable uh, option as you build your band. So we look at four different pieces of information and data that I suggest everybody here track if you're not already. The first is analytics, but not just Google Analytics. You know, that's great to have that set up, but really be paying attention to things like top sellers, seasonality, and paths through your site. Or heat maps, things like scroll maps, click maps, session recordings, uh, eye tracking studies. Those are all great ways to see how people are engaging with your site content. I personally, my favorite is user testing. This is to help us not only understand the what people are doing, which is what all that quantitative data like analytics and, and heat map can tell us, but the more uh, qualitative side of user testing is really going to tell us why. They're going to tell us why people are taking those actions, what they're thinking in that process. And then we take all of that data and armed with this, that data from the other three uh, that I mentioned, we can use math to tell us how to best proceed. And that is what A-B testing allows us to do. So the ultimate goal here is to make data backed decisions. And this helps you navigate uncertainties such as iOS updates that you have no control over and improve your conversion rates on your site. So this is a lot. And there are plenty of ways you can handle this, but it's a starting point. Here are some things that you can do today. Give customers the information they need to convert, starting with your product detail page. Use social proof to build a better customer experience and do research on site instead of having to look at other places for reviews of your brand. And then build trust with your consumer, which is a big part of what we're going to talk about today. For example, give them security they need to know that their transaction is going to be safe, secure, and uh, that it has been proven. So I'm going to pass things off from here in a moment to talk about that third point. But before I do, I really want 
to show you an example of how these elements and more might work together. This is a real life example of a collaboration we did between the good and trusted site for Shoe Mart. Uh, shoe Mart is another shoe brand, uh, shoe reseller, I should say. And uh, in addition to the badges on their homepage, the footer and the checkout page, which they all resulted in a 14% increase in the conversion rate. Um, we also did some testing on this site with the badges about where the best placement might be and what type of badge. And that all had a pretty uh, big impact. So I'll hand it off from here. Perfect. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add that we do have a full case study write up of this test on our blog if anyone is interested in learning more about it. Um, but I just wanted to also point out that um, not only did the shoe bar increase conversions, but their average order value also increased by 13% as well. Um, so that really just goes to show how valuable the addition of trust on your website can be. Um, but at Trusted Site, we really believe that building trust is more than just throwing up a badge on your site. There's a lot of other contributing factors that affect how visitors perceive your website. So um, I'm going to be sharing just a few of our best tips for how to increase trust and customer confidence. So starting with tip number one is to make it easy for your visitors to get in touch with you from the get-go. Um, having contact information like your phone number signals that there's real people behind, your, behind the scenes, um, which is important for eliminating doubts about business legitimacy for your first time visitors. And according to Sleek Note, 51% of consumers trust companies who make it easy for visitors to get in touch. Um, so it's a really great way to just establish trust right off the bat. Um, so what does this look like in practice? Well, what I like to say is to think of it as being like Dwight Schrute from the TV show, The Office. Um, this is one of the few instances where you would actually want to be like Dwight. But um, if you've seen the show, you might remember this scene where Dwight's on a sales call and he sort of aggressively makes sure that his client knows how to reach him by explaining all of his forms of contact information, um, which included not one, but two pager numbers um, and when he can be reached as well. Um, so here's a quick few uh, practical examples. Um, Swanson, as you can see here, has a help and support widget and their header that lists their phone numbers for, vote, for visitors to both call and text. Um, and includes the hours of operation for each of those lines. Um, there's also a link to their Contact Us page, which has more ways that visitors can get in touch. And they've also made sure to include their contact information on the mobile version of their site as well. So another really important thing to have is a live chat widget. Um, we live in the age of instant gratification. So live chat offers a way for you to be able to address visitor questions as soon as they come up. And lastly, another interesting option that has gained popularity during the pandemic is um, offering a live chat video option. And video chat's great because you can give customers the same type of face-to-face -face interaction that they would normally be able to get um, from an in-store experience, but from the comfort and safety of their own home. Um, and so this may or may not make sense depending on the type of product that you're selling, but companies like Lululemon have utilized it to offer product recommendations um, offer help with fit and size, and also provide some gifting ideas as well. So I'm gonna move on to our next tip, which is to show social proof. And 93% of consumers say customer reviews have an impact on their purchasing decisions. So that means nearly everybody is influenced by reviews. Um, your visitors really wanna know whether your products will meet their expectations. And so hearing the experiences of your previous customers is a way for them to get another perspective aside from your own as a business owner or marketer, which is gonna have some inherent bias. Um, so we have a few recommendations for how you can go about incorporating reviews on your site. Um, personally, I love websites that collect detailed reviews because it can give you additional information that's not necessarily available in a standard product description. Um, for example, American Eagle asks customers to rate the item overall and they also and also describe the fit, but um, in addition to that, they ask the customer to share the size of the item that they purchased, as well as to share their height and weight. Um, and in any other context, that might kind of seem like a rude question, but in this case, um, it's to help new customers better gauge the fit of the item because they can see what customers of a similar body type 
have to say about it. And so this is not just limited to the apparel market. Um, when you're collecting reviews, you can try to ask different questions that will prompt customers to share details that are specific to your type of product. Um, but even something as simple as what did you like or dislike about um, the product can be a helpful way to kind of prompt them to share more details. Um, so another thing to do with your reviews is to use them to provide product recommendations. Um, in the instance that the product that they're, um, that, you know, the one that they found is not the one that they're looking for, this gives them a quick way to see other options um, that they might like. And so this widget is offered by Yotpo and it lets you scroll through other top rated products on the site um, and shows an image along with its rating and number of reviews. And the last thing I wanna say about reviews is that unfortunately it's inevitable that you'll receive some negative feedback on occasion, um, but we wanna say that you shouldn't shy away from those because hiding or deleting them is an untrustworthy practice. Um, and that might actually increase visitor doubts because if you only have positive reviews, um, it can start to um, make visitors question the legitimacy of them. And according to Trustpilot, 64% of consumers would actually prefer to buy from a business that's responsive over one that seems um, super, superficially perfect. So we always say to take negative reviews as an opportunity to showcase your great customer service. And when a customer sees that you've taken steps to address an issue, um, it can appear as a sign of trust. And so in this example that we have, you can see how Thrift Books quickly responded to a negative review with an apology and a solution. And so I'm gonna move on to our last tip here, which is our favorite at Trusted Site, of course, and that is to display visual trust indicators like Trusted Site's system of trust marks. Um, we've conducted several consumer surveys over the years, and we found that nearly half of consumers think that a site could be a fraudulent business if it does not display any trust marks. And so that shows that consumers really rely on services like Trusted Site to verify the legitimacy and the safety of the sites that they shop at. Um, and one of the reasons we think that's true is because services like this provide that information as a third party and essentially vouch for the site as an outside entity. And that kind of goes back to what we were saying with reviews, um, where shoppers want to get information about your business from outside of you as a direct source, because at times it can appear to be biased. Um, and so in that way, reviews and trust marks are really great because they provide that information right on your site, um, which discourages your shoppers from leaving and going to Google to search for that information somewhere else. And so instead they stay on your site longer and that means they're gonna be, be more likely to make a purchase on your site. Um, so that said, we have a couple of tips um, for adding trust marks to your website. Starting with, make sure to use trust marks that visitors can interact with so that they can find additional information about what the trust mark means in case they are not already familiar, familiar with what it means. Um, so when you click any trusted site trust mark, the site certification modal appears, as you can see here. Um, and that lets customers be able to learn more about each of the certifications that the site has earned. We also make sure, or we also suggest that you make sure um, that you're careful with how and where you place your trust marks, because when they're placed together, like how you can see here, um, consumers may actually view the checkout or your site as being filled with clutter, and they may doubt the security of the site or in the security of their purchase. So our recommendation is to limit the amount of trust marks in the checkout to no more than three. And we suggest placing a security trust mark as close as possible um, to the credit card fields. And this is really critical because nearly 75% of consumers have concerns when they're asked for their payment information. Um, and so this is a really great example from mybinding.com. They are a laminating and binding materials retailer that actually ran a testing experiment um, with Trusted Site, and they saw a positive impact to their conversions um, by placing the trust marks on their site. And so you can see they have the floating trust mark in the bottom left corner, which is designed to appear across every page of the site. Um, they also have the secure checkout trust mark in the payment method section, and they also have our identity protection trust mark right underneath the place order button. 
And that's going to wrap up my section here on trust building tips. So we're going to shift gears now to do our live website teardown um, and take a look at some of your sites, uh, or at least one of your site that is. Um, and so we're going to be identifying where you could be missing those laws of CRO that John was talking about. Um, and, and additionally, we're going to share some trust building tips um, for this site. So um, that said, the site that we're going to be looking at today is uh, blindsgalore.com. So John, I'm going to pass um, the mic back to you and uh, let you uh, share your analysis. Great. So I'll start by saying that um, obviously we don't have access to Blind, Blind Galore's uh, inf private information, right? The Google Analytics, but we don't need that. However, I did talk about all the things we want to do with data and how we like to make data backed recommendations. So uh, what we did was we went out and we collected eye tracking heat maps and we have a tool that allows us to do this. And so uh, if you go to the next slide, you will see um, this is the heat map. And if you aren't familiar with heat maps, no worries. I'm going to make this really easy. <laughs> it's actually in the name heat maps, right? So the first thing you need to know is that where it is darker is where uh, in red is where more people looked and they spent more time looking which is an important factor. And then uh, it cools off from there. So red, yellow, green, blue. And, uh, and then the gray, gray out areas is where people did not look at all. So it kind of helps you have a good understanding of um, where people are looking and how long they're looking at things. So we're, what we're going to do is start at the top of the page and work our way down to the footer. And I'm going to call out some things that I see here. And um, feel free if you have questions as we go through this to chat them in and um, I'll do my best to uh, track that. I know Lauren is as well um, looking at that. So by all means, uh, please, if you have questions, uh, let's hear them as we go through this. And um, I think Elisa has some questions or some items at the end around trust as well. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, so starting with the uh, first thing here at the top of the page, which is the navigation. Now, I mentioned consumers are at your site for two reasons, to do research and to convert, right? What's the first way that people do research? Well, when they get to a site, they want to make sure they're in the right place and that you, they think that you can help them. The easiest way to do that is to make it um, a product-based navigation. So as you can see here, Blinds Galore did shades, blinds, uh, rooms, features, purpose. There's some things in here that I'm not a huge fan of. Now, I really suggest keeping your navigation to five items or less. The reason being we've done a lot of testing on navigations and more than five people seem to trail off. Uh, but you can see here that uh, people see the logo of Blinds Galore so they know they're at the right site that they were intending to be at. And then they see shades. And then they immediately are drawn down to um, what happens below. So um, if you go to the, the next slide here, uh, you can see that I highlighted and I call out this area. And I do this for two reasons. Now, one is, of course, this is getting the vast majority of the attention on the page because it's the biggest item. It's in your face, right? Um, and it's going to draw attention away from people who are trying to figure out what it is you sell and how you can help them. And the first thing that these people who are doing research learn is, oh, your products aren't worth what you were going to charge me. They're now worth 45% less. I'm a huge believer that discounting is not optimization. It is margin drain. I'm never a fan of offering a discount. You will never, if you work with the good for optimization, you'll never see our team recommend that you do a discount because while that's easy, it's not sustainable. What's going to happen is as a brand, you are training these new customers to be discount customers and that you are a discount brand. Now, if you get a customer, I don't know about you, but when I go shopping someplace, if I pay 45% off, I'm not going to want to pay retail the next time. I'm going to think, wow, last time it was worth 45% less. How do I get that deal again? And then what happens is consumers go off onto other websites. They go to Google and they shop, you know, blinds galore, discount code. Blinds galore sale, and they're trying to look for what are what are these deals? How am I going to get the best deal that's available? So I say this because Blinds Galore is leading with a discount, which is really unsustainable and detrimental in the end. And um, you know, I'm all for doing promotions, uh, excuse me, offers over promotions. What do I mean by that? Well, you should always be giving something instead of taking away. So here you're taking away 45%. 
So it's a dollar or a percentage discount is usually a non-starter. But when you give something like free gifts with purchase, free shipping, um, you know, maybe it's some type of resource or extended warranty on, on blinds, right? Something of that sort can really actually be a value add instead of a discount. And now it may cost you 45%, right? In, in your, your margin, but consumers don't add that up in that same way. They feel like they're getting an additional value and they don't always expect that next time they come to the site. So I'll get off my soapbox on discounting now. We can go to the next page here um, as we kind of continue. Now, I really wanted to, to point this out because um, I'm, I'm highlighting here that uh, we have our designers recommend, which is typically not what consumers are here for, right? So the first thing I would recommend doing is what are all the different types of products that you sell? Let's focus on a product base here and help people along in that journey. Yes, designers might recommend these products, but as a new to file customer, I don't know what I'm looking for exactly or all the categories you can sell. So what we find is that generally, the sooner on a homepage that you can tell people what products you're selling outside of the navigation, the quicker that people will be able to get down that path to conversion um, that is gonna be helpful for them. And so you can see here um, on this uh, also down below uh, those images uh, where uh, we have the price and everything, we're missing a really clear call to action. And this is gonna be something I'm gonna call out as we go throughout this site because you really want to have a clear call to action and tell people what you want them to do. Yes, you can click on each of those images and it will take you to that product detail page. The, it, the problem with that is that you're not really asking consumers to do anything here. And, um, you know, yeah, some will click on it maybe, but you will see that click-through rate dramatically increase if you just put a clear call to action there, and then you be consistent with those call to actions. And while I'm on this, one tip that I see quite often on home pages is where brands will put things like add to cart. The challenge with that is consumers are not ready to purchase just yet. So that high intent to purchase call to action is really something I, I suggest you stay away from. You don't wanna be pushy, right? You just wanna get people to that next step in the decision-making process. So something that's lower intent, like uh, view details or learn more, will perform a lot better than something like add to cart, uh, which consumers won't be ready for yet. Uh, we can go to the next page. Okay, now, if there were two things I could eliminate from the internet, one of them, of course, would be starting with a sale. And often tied with that, as you can see here, is uh, email pop-ups. Now, why is this? Well, it's mainly because most email pop-ups are done in this fashion, which is uh, a big challenge. Here, you're telling the consumer, sign up, and why would I sign up? Well, now I get 50% off. So I'm no longer getting that 45. If I sign up, I get 50. Again, you're really creating a discount customer here versus somebody who is uh, valuing the product. Um, additionally, um, you really need to set three things around expectation. And so first expectation you need to set is what are you signing up for? What types of emails am I gonna get? What type of content am I getting here? That's not explained at all. I just says sign up and I get a discount. Okay, so are you, and then second is how often you're going to email me. Are you gonna email me once a week, once a month, once a year, only special occasions? Well, give me some type of expectation. So now you've primed that consumer to say, hey, we're gonna send you um, helpful home decorating tips every month, okay? And then that's something they may be interested in. You don't have to lead with the discount. And then the third expectation is around privacy, which um, you know here you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, they say review our privacy policy, which, okay, that's great, um, better than nothing, but I would really just clearly state here something simple like we'll never sell your content, your, your uh, contact information. And that way people know that it's pretty secure. So John, quick, quick question here um, mm -hmm. from Russ. What would you change the title to instead of, our designer recommends. Yeah, I don't really have a challenge with um, that subtitle uh, headline there. I have a challenge with the placement of this whole uh, section of content. It's too high up on the page 
And, um, you know, really what you want to do, what, what Blind Schooler is trying to do here is to help people understand the, the line of products and give them some options of where they could perhaps start. And most people are interested in what a designer would recommend because they, you know, when they go to the sites like this, they're A, not typically working with a designer and B, I don't know about everyone on this, on this uh, webinar, but I don't really trust my interior decorating skills over what a designer would do. I assume this unnamed designer knows better than me. So I kind of like the headline, Russ. I don't think that that's a huge issue. I think the biggest issue is placement uh, because it really doesn't tell me all the different types of products and it doesn't help me get further down that funnel. It's just going to send me into, hey, I kind of like this design, but I really still don't know what you know, am I, what type of shade I'm looking for, or, um, you know, is it a shade of blind? I don't know, um, at this stage. Um, okay. Uh, we can, I'll get off my soapbox about, uh, uh email pop-ups as well. Um, they are making a recommendation before displaying what is on offer. Yes. Um, I, that definitely makes sense. Um, so, here again, I talked a little bit about um, having all the different categories higher on the page. This is what I would put right under that promo instead of our, our designers recommend. And then put the designers recommend a little bit further down the page. Um, but what we need here again is clear, consistent call to actions. Um, you can see here that people are looking at the names of the different categories and they look at the, the top first four and then it just drops off. Remember I said rule of five earlier around the navigation, same thing is happening here. You typically see that you get to four to five and people just drop off and stop reading. Um, that's what's happening. So there's so many options. There's, you know, well, what is this? Uh, 10 options. That's a lot to be thinking about and trying to wade through. Um, but this is really not that horrible of a section. I would just add a clear, consistent call to action uh, in each of these. So um, make the, the, text a button even um, and make it look more like it's something you want people to interact with. Pretty simple. Uh, next uh, slide. So I love this one, two, three, four, because again, as somebody who you know, I, I'm somewhat handy, but you know, depending on who you ask, you ask my wife, she'd probably say I'm not. But the reality here is that, you know, I, I have no idea if how I'm going to get the right shades and the right size and how easy it is to install these. And so I love when brands do the one, two, three, one, two, three, four, like they've done here and show you the clear, easy steps. So design from home. Okay. I get it. Like I can easily measure and then customize online. Okay, great. So I come in with my dimensions and then it tells me my options. That's really helpful. And then, oh, you deliver it to me. Okay, great. And I install it myself. Um, and you even say it's easy to install. Now, if I could change anything here, it would be the amount of text below each of those blocks because you can see people aren't really reading that text very much. Um, they kind of are reading the headline and looking at the picture and then the, they fade off over the text. And um, what I would recommend is maybe separating that out a little bit or um, even trying to reduce it down to one or two words uh, if possible. Uh, next slide. Further down the page here, you can see um, that they kind of jump into um, right away uh, Instagram. So these are Instagram photos and um, they actually do something here that's that's pretty good, which is when you click on it, it keeps you on the site and it pops it up. Um, but I see this mistake a lot. So I really wanted to call this out because of two reasons. One is uh, the big mistake I see is that people send Brands send people, their visitors, to Instagram. And they have they display the images from Instagram that people click on them and then they end up in the black hole that is Instagram, never to return to your site because now they're looking at their friends' photos and they're on friends on vacation. They're like, oh, this is awesome. Um, um, they're commenting, liking. Next thing you know, they forgot all about uh, Blinds Galore. So you do want to keep them on your site. What I also wanted to call out here is that you can see very few people are even looking at these photos. And I think that's because up above, we've already shown them so many different types of photos um, of the products that it's really not necessary here. People are interested in the social aspect here. And these don't even look like social photos. It's clear that these are uh, professionally taken photos. 
So um, I highly would recommend maybe scrapping this section and running a test to remove it and see if that helps people scroll further down the page or perhaps putting it at the very bottom of the page just above their footer so that people who get all the way down there and are, you know, maybe they're at that stage. They're like, oh, I, you know, I'm interested, but I just don't know how I would use this product or what I, my options are. I'll check out their Instagram and get some inspiration. Um, so that would certainly be an option. As we keep going down here, um, I think this is really interesting to see uh, that we're calling out uh, free shipping, free samples, no sales tax, and a guarantee. Those are things that um, are common objections, I'm sure, right? Where it's people who are like, hey, I don't really want to pay to have these shipped to me. I can go to my local blind store and get them and not have to do that. Getting free samples of the fabrics, et cetera, is key. We've done a lot with home improvement brands paint brands, fabric brands, um, you know, uh, furniture, et cetera. And free samples is really a great way to get people involved in that funnel and, and have a more confident purchase online. And then of course, nobody wants to really pay sales tax. So that's uh, good to see. And then a guarantee is just that last reassurance tool. So I like all of these um, and you can see people are really engaged with them. So I wanted to call that out too, because I think this is something that could potentially be higher up on, on the page. Um, so maybe even in place of the social that we just saw um, in the sense that it would uh, reassure people who are now scrolling further down the page and they're a little more involved in that shopping journey. The next is social proof. Um, I'm a huge believer in social proof and there's a lot of ways to do this. Um, the as seen in is something on, on the right hand side there. It's something that we have found lately consumers have been becoming a little more skeptical about. And why is that? Well, as seen in typically can mean I advertised in HGTV, right? Or I ran a TV commercial on the Adam Carolla show during that time slot. So you really want to do something here that helps consumers know that um, it was really used in these um, uh, you know, media outlets instead of just being seen on, right? So what does that mean? Well, you could say as featured um, you know, in the show, uh, these shows, something of that sort that really would help people understand. So it's a little language tweak, um, but it really helps people know that it's more than just as seen on, which is um, has, especially in the cosmetics world, has become kind of a, um, a, a black eye, if you will, of that industry. Now, bloggers love blinds galore is something that is really interesting um, to me because you can see people aren't really reading this. They kind of look for what is that one key insight in each of these? What I would really recommend here is to... Um, to really reduce the amount of text underneath each of these so that people engage with them and read it. What's the, you know, just a couple of words, the really short and sweet key point that you want to get across. Most of those are a couple sentences or they really have a lot of additional content in them that's not necessary. Something like in the middle one, I couldn't be more happy about our motorized shade. You could probably get rid of that ace. You know, as a consumer, I understand if you're offering a testimonial that you're happy with the product. So um, something, you know, you could really reduce uh, there and keep people moving through the page. Next, uh, next page. Um, so one of the things here that I, I wanted to call out was that this is missing a clear call to action. I've called this out a few times. I mentioned I would. Um, the challenge here is that you've got people who are clearly interested in free samples. And I mentioned earlier that this is a great way to get people moving through the funnel and uh, get that first step out of the way of, hey, I'm interested in these brands and they're, they're going to spend time loading up with 15 samples and then um, get them shipped to them. But what you've done here is you, you're telling people all about them, but you haven't given them an easy way to start that journey. So really would want to do something that um, takes, helps them take that next step. And so a clear call to action here would be really key. And uh, if we can go down uh, a little bit, one of the things I, um, I find here that's really interesting to me is um, how many, you know, they have free samples listed places, guarantees, you did all these objection busting up above, then consumers get down here and they see all of these asterisks and legal content and they immediately start wondering, okay, what am I missing here? What's the, what's the catch? 
And we see this quite often if we were to do user testing, where we would send people to the site who match the ideal customer profile, ask them to complete some tasks while we record their screen and their audio. I guarantee you we get down here, people are going to start reading this really closely and say, oh, wow, that's a lot of exceptions. And they might start reading it, you can see, and then they kind of fade off. That's exactly what's happening here. Um, and then people go down to the footer. So you're immediately decreasing trust by having something like that. Now, I'm not suggesting that lawyers shouldn't be involved and you shouldn't be safe and le legal with all this, but maybe put those at the very bottom below the footer, all right? So it's not so in, in the consumer's face. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. I want to talk about the footer a little bit because there's some things here that, it, first of all, I just find it overwhelming. Um, and second of all, there's a really, really clear uh, footer outline that if you go to thegood.com and uh, go to our insights section and just search footer, you'll find we have an article that tells you how to outline your whole entire footer. And uh, it's a pretty tried and true method that we have tested several times. On the far left column of your footer, you should have all of your product outline. And you can see they do a good job. They have shop lines and shop shades and uh, skylight shades. So that's great. You want that that um, navigation, but you really don't need the items above it to get free shipping. Um, talk to an expert we'll talk about in a second, but those other reassurance tools I probably wouldn't have in the footer. I would focus on helping somebody who's interested in your brand get it to that next step. Uh, and if a consumer is just confused by a site, first thing they usually do, scroll down to the footer in hopes that they can get uh, all of the product categories outlined like this so they can just search for what they want and get there quickly. In the middle is where I would have those About Us links. And then on the right is where I would have Customer Care and Contact. What would that be? Well, uh, you talked a lot about that earlier, Lisa, around um, having uh, trust signifiers around a phone number and email and ideally a physical address. When we find those three are included, trust just goes way up and it's no longer an issue. Um, and then even better if you have a badge that's verified that information, right? Um, so what I would remove here though is all the credit card icons. There's no reason to have those. I don't know about you, but the last time, I can't recall the last time I've shopped online and they didn't take at least one form of payment that I had available to me. Right. So um, definitely not something that is necessary. And uh, I don't know, do I have one more slide here or not? Uh, nope. Okay. I think we're, I'll pass it over to you. Perfect. Thanks, John. Um, that was all super insightful information. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I just want to add on to, to what John's been talking about here with Blind Scalore and um, give a few ideas on how to make the site a little bit more trustworthy with Trust and Site Trust Marks. Um, so our first recommendation would be to add the floating trust mark to the bottom left corner. Um, this trust mark actually helps to establish trust um, with visitors right off the bat because no matter which page they enter the site, they're going to see it. Um, and in this case, we recommend the bottom left corner because we don't want it to interfere with their help widget um, on the bottom right side. Um, and the nice thing about this trust mark is that um, you know, as users are scrolling down the screen, it stays in place so that there's always a visible trust uh, symbol on the screen. Um, and another great thing is also that they're all trusted site trust marks are fully mobile compatible. Um, so no matter what um, device your visitors are on, they're going to be able to see your trust symbols. Um, so the next thing, um, kind of building off of what John was talking about with this, um, it's really important to kind of be clear about, um, you know, your privacy policy and what that actually means. And so this trust mark that we have, the span free trust mark, um, has shown to help visitors and reassure them that when they submit their email, they're not going to be receiving spam uh, when they sign up for your email list. So it kind of just kind of sets their expectations more clearly um, before they submit their email. And when they click this trust mark, they can actually see data about your email history, like how many emails that you've sent recently and what the subject lines were. Um, and this way, visitors are going to be able to get a more transparent view of what kind of content is going to be heading to their inbox. Um, and so here you can see how it looks on one of our customer sites, which is decorsteals.com. And lastly, we'd also recommend um, simplifying the, the footer a bit, like, like John was saying. Um, 
we, you know, what we found is that sometimes having too many trust badges in one space can send the wrong message or become confusing to the customer. Um, so what we'd recommend is to remove um, those that grouping of three trust marks at the bottom and replace it with the trusted site um, certified secure trust mark just to kind of clear it up a bit. Um, and though that would re mean removing the reseller ratings badge, the good news is that we actually partner with reseller ratings. Um, so when you display your trusted site badges on your site and your visitors click that, they can actually see that um, your star rating from reseller ratings right from the trusted site modal. Um, so, you know, you really get, you still get to share your, your reseller ratings um, reviews directly from trusted site. Um, and so that is gonna wrap up all the content that John and I had prepared for today. Um, we can take maybe one or two questions, I think, um, before we sign off here. Um, John, I noticed a couple in the chat, and I'm not sure if you saw those um, from Neil. <laughs> Yeah, Neil was asking um, about running ads. Uh, so Neil, I think um, you're asking here, when you have partners, where would you um, put product services, et cetera, you'd like to promote? Um, for e-commerce specifically, what one of the, there's a couple of great um, companies out there. I'm trying to think of the name. I can't have top of my head, but um, that allow you to um, basically to uh, partner up with other brands and then post-purchase, allow them to add on to their order uh, your partner's brands. So say that you are a shampoo brand and um, something that you can do is uh, sell your shampoo and then after they get through checkout and have completed that, you can show them post-purchase, here are some body wash brands, right? And, um, and it could be things that you've partnered up with and then they can add that to their order. And um, since Shopify, this is a Shopify plugin I'm thinking of specifically, already has all their, their payment information, it will just process that and ship it to the same address um, from that partner. Uh, so there's a couple of great ones there that, that do uh, a really good job with that. Awesome. Um, if you, anyone else has any other questions, go ahead and submit them now. Um, we'll give it another 30 seconds or so. Uh, Elise, I think we had one up higher up in the chat um, when you were talking about the building trust with reviews. Uh, someone asked, uh, how do you send the customer the option to submit a review? Is there a link? And I think they're referring to how do you collect reviews potentially post-purchase? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that would be something that you know you set up with your, your reviews provider. Um, you know, we, we trust inside partners with, I think, four different um, reviews partners, Trustpilot, Verified Reviews, Reseller Ratings, and um, Reviews.io. So, um, you know, if you sign up for those services and, you know, that would be kind of on an individual basis. Um, and yeah, I don't know a, if you have anything else to add, John. Well, yeah, no, from a, a trust standpoint, I see a big mistake a lot of brands make where they have a button on their product detail page in reviews that says write a review. We have found in user testing that when consumers see that, they immediately um, start distrusting the reviews that are there because anyone can come and leave a review in their mind. So I would really um, have uh, of the recommendation here to... Um, to just allow those emails to a uh, go out that ask for reviews after purchase, and then also um, b to to mark reviews as verified uh, and show that. So those are a couple of, of ideas there, and uh, we have a lot of content up on our site about how to effectively work with reviews, um, no matter who your provider is. Um, all the ones that Elise mentioned are great, though. Uh, so awesome. All right, well, All right. before we wrap up here, um, we have a couple of special offers available to, available to all of you who've attended today. Um, so John, do you wanna go ahead and explain this one? Sure, yeah, so a couple of things, um, you know, you can get a free uh, digital copy ebook of the two books I've written over the years. Opting into optimization is the one that I covered today. Um, and just use the um, code trusted site to get a free copy uh, download of that. Uh, you can do the same for Stop Marketing, Start Selling, which is a book I wrote uh, a, a handful of years ago. Um, 
and it's much more actionable items. Uh, and opting into optimization is all about the theory of how you should be thinking. So you can also get a free landing page assessment if you like the teardown that we did today. Um, if and you are a qualified site, it will ask you to um, confirm some information when you sign up for that. Assuming that you qualify, uh, you can get that there. Uh, feel free to email me. If you have questions, uh, john at the good.com. Don't hesitate to um, just shoot me a note. Uh, I do read every email, do my best to respond, and um, I've given it out for years and nobody's abused it yet. So I, um, I look forward to hearing from you. Awesome. Well, yeah, everyone should definitely take advantage of those um, free offers to them. Um, adding on to that, as a special thank you from Trusted Site, we are offering qualified sites a free testing opportunity to measure the impact of Trusted Site trust marks on your site. Um, so with this opportunity, we'll work with you to create a custom experiment plan and run a test at zero cost to you. Um, this really requires very little of your time and resources, um, but hopefully we'll show you that building trust with your visitors can have a significant impact on your conversion rate. Um, so if you are interested in this opportunity, you can sign up through the link. I believe Lauren is sharing those in the chat right now. Um, we'll also follow up um, in our follow-up email with the recording. The link will be there as well. Um, or you can also reach out to our team directly at partners at trustedsite.com. So that's all that we have for you guys today. Thank you so much for attending. And thank you, John, um, for joining us today and sharing your insights. They were all super helpful. Um, so yeah, we'll see you all next time. All right. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone.